Welcome everyone to the Orvis Guide to Fly Fishing. I'm your host, Tom Rosenbauer. Joining us today is my friend and guest co-host, Phil Rowley. Phil is one of the most recognized stillwater fly fishers in North America. He spent over 25 years developing and refining his stillwater fly fishing techniques. In addition, Phil's authored three books and a series of DVDs on stillwater fly fishing and tying. In this episode, Phil's going to introduce you to the basics of stillwater fly fishing. He'll provide a brief overview on how lakes work, discuss some of the misconceptions many fly fishers have about lakes, the equipment requirements, including rods and lines, how to locate fish in lakes, stillwater entomology, presentation tactics, along with some basic thoughts on stillwater fly selection. I'm not the greatest stillwater fly fisher in the world, so you're in good hands with Phil. It promises to be an interesting and educational episode. On today's show, we're going to show you everything you need to know about fly fishing still water. I'm going to give you the tools you need to know so you can go out and enjoy this kind of sport for yourself. It's going to be a great show. And off he goes. Oh, wow. Because this is the way you can. This show has been brought to you by Orvis Rod and Tackle. Ontario, yours to discover. Ontario's Algoma region, where Huron and Superior meet. Fly fishing for stillwater trout offers many rewards. Unlike rivers and streams, lakes are not subject to annual runoff. With the exception of spring and fall turnover, lakes offer a long open water season. Turnover is a mixing process that reoxygenates and re-energizes a lake. When it occurs, the turnover process puts fish off the bite for roughly a week. Turnover does not occur, however, on all lakes. Rich productive lakes offer diverse food base, offering even the most ardent hatch matcher a lifetime of presentation puzzles to solve. The rich food base also offers another important benefit, the capacity for large trout. Trout in productive waters can and do reach staggering proportions, typically exceeding the growth rates of those living in rivers or streams. Not all lakes are created equal. Based upon the nutrient makeup and levels, lakes are often classified by their trophic status. Oligotrophic waters are deep, clear, and low in nutrients, offering little in the way of productive shallows to grow large trout. Eutrophic lakes, on the other hand, are typically shallow, rich bodies of water. Featuring soft, fertile bottoms, eutrophic waters are home to vast, shallow regions lush with weeds and an often dense population of aquatic invertebrates and forage fish. Eutrophic lakes are capable of producing trout of gargantuan proportions. Algae blooms are also common on many eutrophic lakes. Mesotrophic waters are midway between oligotrophic and eutrophic lakes. Mesotrophic lakes are often clear and can support good populations of trout. take a moment to talk to you about the fly rod choices available to you when fly fishing lakes. Stillwater rod preferences differ slightly than those for rivers and streams. Depending upon the size of the fish, wind, line choice, and angler preference, four to seven weight rods are ideal. I recommend a six weight rod nine and a half to ten feet long. If you're planning on casting faster sink rate lines, a shorter nine to nine and a half foot rod would suffice. Longer progressive action or mid-flex rods are popular with many stillwater fly fishers. Long rods work well with floating and slow sinking lines. They allow greater working distance between an indicator and fly, improved roll casts, help form open loops necessary when casting long leaders or indicators, steer and control fish during the fight, and fishing the hang. The hang is a presentation technique at the end of the retrieve where the rod is raised and paused prior to recasting to induce any fish following the fly to take. Shorter, faster, tip flex rods are well suited to casting heavy, fast sinking lines. 
And this fish is strong. It's dictating the fight to me right now. And this is the beauty of long rods too that we use in still waters is we can steer the fish. I can hold this fish out away from the boat, keep it clear of anchor ropes and other things that may foul and get in the way. Oh yeah, this is a nice brown. And we're keeping the rod sideways to get the bend of the rod to defeat the fish. Tip high for running fish, sideways, pressure, left and right, alternate, opposite to the direction the fish is pulling. So we keep the fish off balance and tire it quickly. When it comes to fly line selection, there are lots of choices. The floating line most river and stream fishers have is an ideal lake line. Floating lines can be used with long leaders, 15 feet or greater, a technique often used for slow nymphing presentations, and of course suspending flies beneath strike indicators. A floating line in lakes is a valuable tool. It needs to be in your kit bag. Whether you use the floating line with long leaders, 15 feet or greater, or with strike indicators. Strike indicators allow you to control two key presentation elements, speed of retrieve and depth. Originally used to suspend coronamids or midge patterns, now we suspend leeches, minnows, scuds, you name it, you can hang it under an indicator and have success fly fishing still waters. So bring that floating line along. Sinking lines are also an important component of your still water kit bag. There are a wide range of sinking line densities available today from slow sinking intermediates to super fast type 6 and 7 lines. A sinking line sink rate is measured in inches per second. Lines that sink very slowly, like an intermediate, right down to very fast, such as a type 5, 6, or even 7. The numbers correspond to the sink rate of the line. So a type 2 line would sink at approximately 2 inches per second, a type 3, 3 inches per second, and so on. The sink rate's important for a technique we call the countdown method. The countdown method involves knowing a line's sink rate and counting the line and fly down so it works, typically just above the bottom. For example, if you're using a fly line that sunk at 3 inches per second and you wanted to get the fly down 10 feet, you would need to let your line sink 40 seconds, as it would take the line 4 seconds to sink 1 foot. Sinking line choice is based in part upon water depth, retrieve speed, and fish activity. Active fish are more likely to chase a faster moving fly. It is important to choose a line that does not sink faster than the fly moves through the water. In many instances, slower sinking lines work best. My recommended fly line choices for someone starting to fly fish for stillwater trout would be a floating line, a clear intermediate, and a fast sinking type 3 full sink line. When fly fishing lakes, your fly reel often becomes more than a storage system for your fly line. Trout in productive lakes grow large and are more than capable of taking you well into your backing. Choose a reel with a solid smooth drag system, interchangeable spools to hold different fly lines, and at least 50 yards of backing. Lakes offer limited shoreline wading opportunities due to soft bottoms, shoreline vegetation, and backcast issues due to surrounding trees and bushes. As a result, most stillwater fly fishing takes place from a boat, pontoon boat, or float tube. Although you can drift, paddle, or troll on lakes with good effect, having an anchor system to tether yourself in place provides absolute control over your presentation while eliminating annoying sway. Many fly fishers find lakes daunting and nearly impossible to read. Staring at the vast featureless body of water before them, many feel a sense of helplessness. With no discernible character, common to rivers and streams, finding fish seems impossible. Yet, with a bit of education, finding trout in lakes is not all that difficult. Many fly fishers, when they come to lakes, automatically think about working the shoreline areas. And while these are often great places to prospect, there are other regions of the lake you should take advantage of. And this can be done by simply understanding the three primary needs of stillwater trout. Comfort, 
protection and food. Water temperature is one of the key aspects of still water trout fishing. Each species of fish has their own preferred temperature range. For most situations, you want to find water temperature in the 50 to 60 degree range. This is ideal trout temperatures. They will process food fast, their metabolism will be high, they'll eat often, and you have the best opportunity of catching fish. It's important to remember that as water temperature increases, its ability to hold oxygen decreases. Trout simply aren't comfortable and will retreat to deeper, cooler waters or their activity will slow and they'll cease to feed. A simple thermometer is an ideal tool when you fly fishing lakes. As with trout in moving waters, trout in still waters can exhibit both selective and opportunistic behaviors. In lakes, trout are very opportunistic on the food sources they prey upon, meaning in the absence of a hatch, they'll prey upon just about anything they come across. But they're very selective about the depth of water they choose to hold in. Factors affecting depth include available sunlight, bright light tends to drive them deeper, changes in atmospheric conditions, barometric pressure tends to drive them deeper when it drops, available forage, they're going to go to areas of the lake where they can find food, and water temperature. So the next time you visit your favorite lake, consider these factors of where you want to go on the lake and at what level you want to present your fly. When you're looking for trout in still waters, there's two types of structure to consider. Submergent and emergent structure. Emergent structure would be things like sunken branches, emergent vegetation, lily pads, beaver lodges. These are areas that are going to attract bait fish, aquatic nymphs, and other invertebrates. Examples of submergent structure include weed beds, sunken islands, humps, depressions, troughs, Areas of transition, any irregularity that's going to attract and hold trout. These are the areas we want to look for, search out, and explore with our flies. A lake's character lies beneath the water's surface. Although lake structure is not as visible at first glance as it is on moving water, it is still there if you know what to look for. You can use the surrounding topography as a guide to what lies beneath. A shallow sloping shoreline would indicate shoals and weed beds. A steep-sided shoreline suggests a quick drop into deep water. Underwater contour or bathymetric maps are available from many locations via the internet. These can be studied prior to arrival to obtain a mental picture of a lake's structure. Once on the lake, sounders are invaluable tools for locating subtle structure nuances not visible on larger scale bathymetric maps. Trout hunt and cruise the shallow shoals of a lake. These areas 20 feet deep or less provide ideal habitat for both trout and prey due to aquatic plant growth stimulated through photosynthesis. Stillwater trout have lots of food to choose from. Hatch matching stillwater fly fishers can be kept busy for many years. Some of the menu items stillwater trout have to choose from include coronamids or midges, mayflies, caddis, damselflies, dragonflies, scuds, leeches, forage fish, snails, crayfish, water boatmen, and back swimmers. Terrestrial insects such as ants and grasshoppers can be important at certain times of the season. Presentation requirements for lakes differ from rivers or streams. First of all, the fish moves and the water doesn't. Stillwater trout are almost constantly cruising. Rod tips must be low or in many instances stabbed into the water to ensure a straight line connection between you and your fly so you don't miss takes. The success in your presentation typically does not rest in the fly you choose, but the depth you present it at and the manner in which you move or retrieve your fly through the water. There we go, fish on, fish on. Oh, this is a nice rainbow, nice rainbow. And this just shows the value of the still water of trees. Unlike rivers, you don't have the current 
flow to animate your flies. You have to do it with your hands. So once we land this fish, I'm going to show you some of the retrieves you need to know to be successful on lakes. Nice fish. This is a good rainbow. He's coming into me now. He could bolt quickly and I'll have my fly line under my feet and bad things will happen. We'll lose, we'll part company and we'll break off and lose a fly. But he's tired, he's showing his sides. He's ready to net and all I do is I don't chase him. Usually they'll have one last run before they come to the boat. And there we go, a beautiful still water rainbow. Still water fish can get big full of energy, which is good. So to hold a still water fish, you don't want to squeeze it. Just support it gently, just like that. He'll calm down, give him a drink, make sure his gills are wet. And look at how calm he stays. When fish struggle, it's because typically you're gripping them too tight and they don't like it, so they fight you back. So we admire that, we'll hold him up and we'll let him go. And just, you don't have to pull him back and forth. Just look at his gills. He's recovering. The water's nice and cool, well oxygenated. And when he's ready, he'll just swim out of your hands, let him fight a bit, and off he goes. There you go. You can't beat still water. When it comes to lakes, you'll soon discover you don't have the same amount of current that you do in rivers. You can't rely on the water to animate your fly. You have to do it yourself using your hands. In still waters, there's two retrieves we use, a strip retrieve and a hand twist. Let me show you them both. First of all, no matter the retrieve, rod position is key. We need straight contact between ourselves and the fly. Rod tip at or in the water surface. Line is up to the rod hand and either pinched against the handle or using your thumb and forefinger to control. All the retrieves are done behind the rod hand. To do the hand twist, I take the thumb and forefinger of my non-casting hand, that's my left hand in this case, and I just weave my hands like so. Depending on the number of fingers I use and the pace of the motion, I can use this busy retrieve to imitate a whole host of prey items. Fly fishers, when they fish lakes, generally don't let their flies sink long enough and they don't move them slow enough. The hand twist retrieve allows those slow retrieves because it's busy. You think you're doing a lot and you're moving the fly, but really you're just darting and bobbing that fly along at a natural pace. The other retrieve is the strip retrieve. And as the name would imply, we simply strip or pull the line behind the rod hand. We can make long pulls to imitate leeches or minnows. We can make short choppy pulls to imitate perhaps a damsel nymph or a scud, or we can do ultra slow pinches when we're imitating coronamid larva or pupa. No matter what the retrieve we use, we can only affect three variables. The length of the pull, the speed of the pull, and the pace of the overall motions. By playing with those variables, we can imitate everything we need to imitate when it comes to fly fishing lakes. Many times when you're fly fishing lakes, you might see another angler doing well. The first question that springs to mind is often, I wonder what fly they're using. Before thinking about that, why not think about DRP, depth retrieve pattern. Think about it. Are you using your fly at the right depth? Are you retrieving it at the right pace? Then think about changing the pattern. If you're doing the fly at the right depth, retrieving it at the right pace, then change the fly. Remember, most still water fly fishers don't let their flies sink long enough and don't retrieve them slow enough. When it comes to choosing flies for still waters, you've got three basic categories. Suggestive flies that may represent a number of different food sources having different features common to all. Realistic flies that are good in really selective conditions, clear waters. These are flies that look very close to the actual food source. And then attractor flies, when fish perhaps aren't in a feeding frame of mind, but they'll chase something. They're naturally aggressive predators, and we use bright, garish, wobbly, mobile flies to take advantage of that trait. Many popular river and stream patterns also work on lakes. A San Juan worm or brassy suggests coronamid larva. Prince nymphs make a passable mayfly nymph for back swimmer imitation. Hairs ear nymphs make both good scud and mayfly imitations. 
The pheasantail nymph can suggest coronament pupa, damsel nymphs, mayfly nymphs, along with small baitfish. A stonefly nymph such as the Montana stone can pass as a dragonfly nymph. Woolly buggers suggest leeches, dragon and damsel nymphs, as well as forage fish. Marabou muddlers and zonkers can also be used to imitate forage fish. Here we go, fish on. Nice fat little rainbow. And the rewards speak for themselves. A nice plump, plump rainbow. He's all right, little. And off he goes. So there you go, it's that simple. Find the right location. Be observant. See what food sources are available. Match that food source with your fly and your presentation choice and you catch fish in lakes. It can be that simple. All right, we've got what appears to be a really nice brown, typical brown strike. We have a small olive minnow pattern on the dropper. He hasn't eaten that. And you don't want to chase the fish, but if you can, anticipate his direction, put the net in front of him, and he swam right in. What a magnificent brown trout. Wow. Look at that. Is that a fish or what? That's a fish of dreams, and on many productive lakes, a realistic expectation. We're gonna let him go. He can grow to be bigger, and we can catch more just like him. What a gorgeous fish. And off he goes. For more information on fly fishing lakes, please visit the Orvis Landing Center at orvis.com forward slash learn to fly fish. This show has been brought to you by Orvis Rod and Tackle. Ontario, yours to discover. Ontario's Algoma region, where Huron and Superior meet.